a challenge to do satire in the age of President Trump. I'm <laughs> reminded of the film Idiotocracy. <laughs> a lot of people have said it reminds me of the film Idiotocracy. And not having seen the film Idiotocracy, I assume it explains the situation much better than I'm going to be able to. It was uh, hilarious in the 90s because they said Trump would end up president. Wait, legit? Alexander Petri writes the Washington Post's compost blog. Not a take to organic gardening, but instead a lighter take on the news and opinions of the day, satire and humor. She's the author of A Field Guide to Awkward Silences. In her spare time, she is a playwright. She joined the Washington Post as an intern after graduating from this distinguished college in 2010. And we are delighted to have her here today. Welcome, Alexandra. So well, thanks my, for having me. Um, my first question is, uh, is it a challenge to do satire in the age of President Trump? I'm <laughs> reminded of the film Idiotocracy. <laughs> a lot of people have said it reminds me of the film Idiotocracy. And not having seen the film Idiotocracy, I assume it explains the situation much better than I'm going to be able to. It was uh, hilarious in the 90s because they said Trump would end up president. Wait, legit? Yes. Oh, man. Well, i got to check this out. Uh, but I think people, some people think, well, it's got to be easier because Donald Trump is a walking, uh, like, sort of, Everyone always goes to the words Cheeto and like it's a word association cloud of like it's a Cheeto But he's also sort of melted and you know, there's something to do with the hair and Given that he has all of these traits then how could it not be easy to write satire and jokes about such a human being? But I actually think it's more difficult because the world itself is already we're like living in one of those dolly paintings where the clocks are melting and there's like a bone structure that's running the Department of Agriculture. And, <laughs> and so you just, all you have to do is look around and describe what's going on, and people accuse you of having written uh, surreal you know, horror, <laughs> which is great, because I always like wanted to also have a sideline writing surreal horror, and now I just do my day job, and people are like, yeah. That's terrifying, <laughs> yeah. What, uh, w what is the, your, what surprised you most about your current job? I think both, I, I guess it surprises me that people read, read my stuff. <laughs> it's always a pleasant surprise. Um, but the thing that surprised me most probably was that the White House was reading my stuff and that it sent out one of my columns in their morning email. That was delightful uh, and a big surprise. Although it, it was not a shock. <laughs> the idea that the White House currently constituted had read an article, or at least the headline of an article, that was clearly satire and had decided to send it out to everyone who subscribed. It was surprising, but not shocking. Um, <laughs> but the fact that in the afternoon they took it down, implying that it wasn't that they'd read the whole article and had sort of agreed with it, but that they had not read it and still sent it along was disappointing to me, because I thought maybe I finally figured out the way in where I can convince them, you know, that, it, like, Maybe we should just start writing the coverage that Donald Trump really wants in his head to get. Because, like he said, I thought when I got elected president that the people would start saying nice things about me. <laughs> because that's how it works in America. Um, one of the rules of our democracy uh, is that you have to say nice things about the president. I think J Jefferson was very insistent on that point. Um, and so he was disappointed when that didn't happen. So I kept thinking, well, what if you wrote as though it were happening? So. Anyway, that was and, and, a tangent. And was there, is, how did you learn about that? About, well, I, I learned about it because I got a phone call from, it was funny discovering who in my friend circle subscribed to the Daily 1600. Um, <laughs> but I got a phone call from someone saying, hey, so I'm going to interview you about the fact that you were sent in this article. And I thought, well, gosh, if I'm being interviewed about this, I better go write a piece about it so I don't get scooped by myself. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I, I found out because first someone emailed me and then I got a phone call from a reporter at the Daily Beast being like, hey, your news now. <laughs> Real news. How does it feel? <laughs> What's it like being a columnist in the, especially a humor and satire columnist in the age of Twitter? I, well, Twitter's great because it's a good place to put puns that otherwise would fill every article and sort of overflow it like Stregonona's pasta and ruin things. Um, 
And so instead I can... It's, it's a pun relief valve. Exactly, the, yeah, a pun dumpster. <laughs> um, and so I can, I can safely deposit puns there, and then I can go forth to the rest of the column and write something that's not entirely made up of bad puns. So in that way, it's useful. It's also good because if everyone is watching an event happening, sometimes there will be jokes that people are clearly making the second it's happened, and then you think, I have to write a different joke than that. Um, so it's useful in that way. It, it encourages more originality? Well, it, because everyone's sort of running to make, like, the clear, the sort of directly connecting point A to point B, joke-wise, joke. And so you have to figure out, is there a way of doing something that gets you, like, via C to point B? Not, not to get all uh, ge geometric on this, <laughs> because I was an English major, so. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you think about the role of, of satire in in the news ecosystem or in the media world, right? From, uh, from the, the, you know, the role of The Daily Show, the kind of canonical role of The Daily Show has played here in many ways as a primary source for a generation on news to, um, to The Onion, The Onion and The Borowitz Report and these, these outlets. I mean, how, how do you, it almost feels like, it almost feels like the satire and comedy outlets are as important, if not more important, than a lot of the mainstream coverage. Well, I think that's that's interesting. I think I remember our generation uh, used to get a lot of flack about how we watched The Daily Show so much, and everyone's like, "You're getting your news from The Daily Show," and I'm like, "That's not." The Daily Show wouldn't be funny if we were getting our news from The Daily Show. It's funny because we already know what the news is this week, and we want someone to yell at it with us. And so I think because these days everyone's sort of awash in a giant sea of information. And sometimes if you're processing that on your phone and you want to have a verbal person, like so someone sort of verbally yelling along with it, uh, then what The Onion will do, or to a certain extent what I will do, will be useful to you and if you want to sit in front of your television at night and instead of watching Lester Holt sort of calmly patiently explain what's going on uh have someone yell at it with you then there's <laughs> many outlets for that uh and so I think it, it, it there the news shows now that all exist are sort of the second generation uh a response to these things and it's funny because like Colbert used to be this thing that had never existed before it was like this parody of a thing and then he's like, what I really wanted to be growing up was just a normal late night show host. And so he's sort of gone to doing that. But all these people who grew up watching him do what he did was like, no, that's way more interesting. I want to do that instead. So you've got all these sort of fake anchors who are trying to both tell news stories like John Oliver every week because he, he tries to sort of add value. And so I, I think it's interesting. I mean, like this is also a way of getting news to people or of helping them process the news. Do you worry at all about satire in a world of kind of s dramatic and significant misinformation? Yeah, actually, the first time, though, that I might like one of my pieces got mistaken for real news was well, had nothing to do with Trump. It was back in like, I want to say 2011 or something, right after they had a cache of letters that was discovered from the creator of Peanuts, Charles Schultz, and he had all these love letters. And so I had made a fake cartoon in MS Paint of Snoopy saying some things, being like, I'm a flawed man. And it, it seemed very obvious, A, that it was not an original Charles Schultz drawing because it was done crudely in MS Paint by me, um, and B, that they weren't, that this couldn't possibly have been a, a real Peanuts comic at any point. But a, I think it was the Telegraph picked it up and was like, and here are some examples of in the comics, we found these things that Charles Schultz that would totally have given away that he was having this affair. And I thought, oh no. So, <laughs> like, I, and there was a phase when I was still starting out the blog when I would get a lot of comments being like, what is this very poorly written news article that seems made up? And, <laughs> and then, yeah, these days with all the fake news, I do sometimes worry, I'm like, am I making life worse for the post by being a thing that says Washington Post on top of it, but is made of jokes. But I think if you read any of it, like, usually the point that it's trying to make is not just like, I'm lying and you can cite this. It's telling a story or making an argument. And so it's not like a lot of fake news websites that are like officially fake news will say it's satire somewhere like hidden, but it'll just be a story where it's like Hillary Clinton stabbed my uncle. And that's that's not really satire, that's yeah. just a lie. Um, <laughs> For the record, did Hillary Clinton stab your uncle? I mean, not my uncle. Okay. I, <laughs> I want to read to you uh, 
your November 6th column headlined, Trump's attempts to console the nation are almost always exactly wrong. <laughs> Trump's speeches in the wake of domestic gun violence by white men could not be mistaken for the words of someone who intends to try to do anything whatsoever about the problem. Trump's speeches always have the quality of some one misremembering the lyrics to a country song. <laughs> but it is not just that they are bad, although they are bad, it is that they are empty. Well, I guess I'll descant on this. Um, <laughs> I have been, I know one of the jobs of the president, and I basically say all this in the columns. If you already read the column, you can, you know, look at your phone and do whatever it is that's going on, because I'm going to basically summarize what I said in it. But I know one of the responsibilities that the presidency has inherited in this world that we live in that's rife with uh, unprevented acts of chaos is that you have to console the nation and uh, bind up its wounds and speak to the widows and the orphans. And one of the things that the Trump presidency has been driving home it, across the board in many ways is that not everyone can be president. Like, anyone can be elected president, <laughs> certainly, but there are certain jobs that, like, it's actually hard to be president. I used to be like, you know, I could, theoretically, if I wanted to be president someday, I could probably handle it. And watching Trump do it, I'm just like, no. <laughs> there are tasks that involve skill and compassion and delicacy and I know now that like The Rock maybe shouldn't be president. I mean, maybe he should if he surrounds himself with capable people. And I'm sad that we've reached the point where this is a state where I'm like, The Rock, if he surrounds himself with a good team, <laughs> might still be. But um, no, but, and among those responsibilities is having to sort of come in front of the nation and say something when something tragic happens and sort of c console people. People seem to want that. And Trump has given these sort of void speeches where he says all this problem that people people usually say, oh, like in the darkness, there's a single light. But he says it so emptily, he doesn't mention any specifics whatsoever. He sort of is like, and that's what true professionalism means. And he stops the sentence before the sentence ends. And so why people were surprised when uh, it came out that in speaking to a gold star widow, he didn't say anything consoling when he has to speak to the whole nation. And what comes out sounds like this uh, is, I don't know, I was struck by that. And so every time I've had, had to watch this, and it's already been too many times because he's so clear about not wanting to do anything about it, it's, I've been, I'm feeling ire boil up within me, and I guess it came out. And is that how you would describe the process by, by which you write columns and figure <laughs> them out? Yeah, the, the, it stops being magma and becomes lava, and that's the point when a column appears. Um, <laughs> just using lots of metaphors today. <laughs> but, no, I think... It's like Magneto, like he uses rage and that's what triggers his power. And then he's able to like make your, you know, dangerous metal uh, necklace fly around and kill you uh, in the forest. Not that I'm spoiling a specific scene, but I guess I am in retrospect. <laughs> Sorry if you haven't seen, uh, well, so, <laughs> but I think p different people have different sort of impetuses for their writing or for making their like confetti spark out of their fingers. I think that's what Jubilee's power is. I'm not actually sure what Jubilee does. I assume it involves confetti. But mine, I think, is either rage or or just I'll see something happening and I want to say, does anyone else see that this is also going on? Let me just describe it and we'll agree that this was a real thing that happened. So, incredulity. What, uh, are, are you going to write a col column about Carter Page's Oh, yeah, I've yeah. already written it and sent it into the desk, in fact, but uh -huh, uh -huh. it's like 2,300 words long because the original was 240 pages long, so I'm like, it's, gonna, it's much shorter compared to the original. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's, I, so the editor is now wa wading through it with a weed whacker, and I think we'll hopefully emerge with something sort of coherent. Because did anyone else read the testimony? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, someone's nodding. Uh, but this is how you know you're in the light, right line of work when you're like, I stayed up until 2 a.m. last night reading the Carter Page testimony, and it was awesome. Uh, people in my hotel like could hear me laughing hysterically. Because you'd come across a sentence where they were reading his emails back to him, and he'd sent this email saying, I can't wait to download the insights I received from senior members of the... Uh, senior officials in the Russian administration and also members of the Duma, and then... But then what he described actually, he's like, but really it wasn't, I didn't talk to anyone there. I spent maybe 10 seconds talking to a person in the hallway whose name I didn't even know. And then I watched the television and that's what I was talking about. And they're like, so wait, your insights were you were going to describe watching the television in Russia and then talking to a man for 10 seconds? But anyway, the column will do it better, I swear. Um, but. but it's kind of like a cognitive dissonance then. Yeah. 
No, I, I think people often ac accuse me of writing satire, and I'm like, I just basically described exactly what happened. <laughs> if you think it was like too bizarre to be happening, that's on the world. I'm going to read another another uh, <laughs> another column headline: How Paul Manafort came by nine hundred thirty-four thousand three hundred fifty dollars in antique carpets. <laughs> Buried among the revelations in the indictment against former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort is the fact that he paid almost a million dollars to an antique rug store in Alexandria. Everything else about the story is also amazing, but I do not want to lose sight of this carpet. <laughs> <laughs> you go on to imagine how he went to spend that kind of money on the carpet. I think, because every so often you still have to have joy in your life. And to me, <laughs> the greatest part of all of those indictments coming out it was not just the fact that they were finally coming out, although everyone in DC was like, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. Um, but, uh, <laughs> hooray. Um, and they, like, they have a cocktail called the Moscow Mueller that you can get like as a discount whenever there's an indictment. Moscow Mueller. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are like, DC is a swamp, and I'm like, yes, but there's C-SPAN on the radio. Um, so, uh, wherever that gets you. No, but, so, I feel like the carpet thing, it's just, well, one explanation could be the fact that he spent like 250000 in an even increment. Like, it could be that he was like maybe laundering money through there. But what if he genuinely went in and bought $934,350 worth of carpet? And just picturing that, because you know like you go into a store and you think, I'm going to buy like one object, and then you, you know, the, the salesman implies that you know what you're doing, and then you have to keep buying things. And then, like, they've been invested in you for so long, you're like, well, it's been half an hour that you've spent with me. I have to buy that next hat you've suggested, even though I don't need a hat. <laughs> this isn't 1840. Um, but anyway, so well, the you piece say explores that concept. modestly spreading your hands. I dabble. I like a good, frantically, you try to remember the attributes a good carpet should have, piling. <laughs> ah, yes, the salesman says smoothly, a good tall pile, then you had better come with me. Did you go, have to go research this at a carpet store? I, surprisingly, I like knew more than I thought about carpet, but I did sort of Google what's the price range for a typical antique rug, and it turns out anywhere from like 2000 upwards, like you That's can spend $10,000 on like one really nice carpet if it's got like, you know, the image of Jesus in it. Are there online communities devoted to carpet? Probably. probably. I mean, yeah. one of the rules of the internet is there's always, always an online yeah. community <laughs> devoted to whatever it is. And did you get any flack for, for that column from the carpet community? You know, <laughs> the, the carpet baggers, if you will. Um, <laughs> I think that's the term of art used among the carpet community. Um, no, I, I didn't, actually. I think I got one email from someone saying uh, that they liked it, but they didn't seem to have any particular carpet expertise. Do you um, do you have any uh, do you have any when you look at your peers in the media and them rushing to cover every tweet from Donald Trump, is that ever something you think about satirizing or how how do you think about your your colleagues who don't you know you have a lot of freedom in a sense I, I guess as a columnist and how do you think about your colleagues in the media and the job that they they're forced to do. I'm very sympathetic to anyone trying to do any kind of journalism right now. Um, and I think the sort of the tweet following, on the one hand, some people are like, don't be distracted by this. And, it's, and while it is true that whatever last week's major news story was that devoured the airwaves is also still going on this week and we're just talking about something different. And so that is a terrifying cumulative pile of stuff, uh, speaking of carpet. Uh, <laughs> but I think... The people who have to watch his Twitter and sort of hope that the world won't end are doing like the Lord's work. My, my favorite, uh, these, I heard a talk where one of them was describing uh, the tweet that came out when they changed uh, the rules for uh, transgender service members, the, the tweet about that. And the first half of the tweet was like, big thing coming at the Pentagon, if only, and then it just sort of like fell off. And there was like a 10 minute waiting period when you think, what is the Pentagon doing? And just picturing like the guys, you know, arming missiles and other people like running around with like pamphlets being like, what's changing at the Pentagon? And just like that period of not knowing. And the fact that it does all hinge on tweets, that's the world we're living in now. And I think you have to describe it. And that's what journalism is. Uh, talk today, we have big elections happening in Virginia. Yeah. Arguably Washington Post, hometown paper. Uh, w do you have any predictions, any observations about that race? Uh, well, my favorite thing has been all the ads, because I get to see on television, you have 
these really just amazing ads that are being put out by the Gillespie campaign where it's like Ralph Northam has unleashed, you know, uh, plague rats into the halls of schools and he like loves sex offenders more than anything and like here's Ralph Northam saying I love sex offenders and, and I am proud to have released them and like all the things or, or like and then all these like like not even like a dog whistle because a dog whistle would imply that there was like some subtlety instead of like here's MS-13 a gang in your neighborhood and Ralph Northam put him there uh, <laughs> it's like genuinely an ad that's out there and then poor Ralph Northam's ads are all like I am a doctor and as a doctor I would like to agree with Donald Trump if he said good things but he doesn't so I can't I'm a doctor <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I sort of wish he had better ads than that but like it's very strange that, I, I, I guess my observation is, I hope that the Gillespie tactic of really just unleashing, like all the neighborhood dogs are screaming in pain, um, the, the ads at this volume doesn't work, because if that works, we're gonna have a sort of a, be, have to acknowledge even more what a gross world we're living in. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, do you see? I was wondering, <laughs> oh man, I I love all, th this is hard. This is like one of those like, uh, as Lindsey Graham put it once, uh, marry, date, or make disappear forever scenarios. Um, <laughs> and I guess, oh man, I, I'm gonna de deal with it as such. I think. I, I mean, I love Reductress, and I love that like it's both like political and feminist, which is great. I miss the toast so much because the toast to me was just purely humor that existed. If you love the things that it was a humor about things that you love, as opposed to humor about things that make you angry. I mean, sometimes it was also about things that made you angry, and it hosted really remarkable essays. But just like for women writing on the internet and reading on the internet, the toast was just such a magical, wonderful place. And the comment section was nice, which never happens ever. Oh my God! Like Jean Weingarten at the Post. He always says reading a uh, news article and then looking at the comments is like ordering a steak and getting a side of maggots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think, I mean, I love ClickHole because it's so absurdist and I feel like as a, as a millennial, which is a horrible way to start a sentence, that's sort of, uh, that's where R my brain Representing goes. my generation, you could say. Yeah. <laughs> as a voice of a generation. Um, no, but, so I think... The Onion, though, I mean, sometimes all you need is a really good headline, and they do—they still do headlines better than anybody. So that's my breakdown. Uh, but yeah, I miss the toast. Other questions? H how did you come to start the blog? I started the blog back in the day. Um, I was—we. This is like the post used to only have blogs with like post puns in the name, or at least that was my impression. It could have been entirely inaccurate, but I like, I thought at one point we had a blog about birth called like postpartum, which I now I think I've been told is incorrect, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so we had like postpartisan. Apocryphal, apocryphal yeah. you could say. <laughs> yeah, fake news. Um, but we had like postpartisan, which was where all the sort of, we were hoping to have like a, the conversation would happen. And so I kept writing stuff for that. And then Dana Milbank also did stuff and they're like, you both like to make jokes, you should have a blog together and so we had a blog together for a while and you can sort of trace the origin of the blog because um, we used to have a cartoon of both of our heads uh, that was made and so it, at first it was just a giant picture of Dana's head and everyone would comment on it, everything I wrote as though like Dana Milbank had written it being like why are you saying you're like 23 you aren't and <laughs> <laughs> and then it was a comic like a cartoon of both of us and then like they just removed the cartoon of his head one morning because he, he was just like I'm an op-ed columnist like I don't need to do a blog every day <laughs> and or like and then uh or, or, or something there. Like I, I feel like I'm like flippantly having him be like blogging, but like no, he, he he's a good dude who's doing an excellent thing. Um, and then uh, it just was my head. That was a long-winded tale of <laughs> of woe. Yes. <laughs> Two other questions from the audience. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maria from Germany. I'm a deputy editor of a newsroom there, national newsroom, and I wonder what is a newsroom surrounding, uh, offering you as a place of work as opposed, you know, the editorial of the Daily Show or 
another comic comedy, uh, you know, place? What is it that you that we we as journalists have to offer a, a, a satire writer? Well, I think I actually, I think that's a really good question. I I sort of think of it as a, a distinction between sort of print versus video. Like how how do you make your jokes and on the one hand, just writing in sort of the traditional column format where you, all you have is words and a page or an internet page, depending on the case, is limiting. But in other ways, it's freeing because you could ask people to sort of imagine and picture things that they wouldn't be able to sort of see uh, without like great work in Photoshop and CGI do otherwise. And I also think that sort of being surrounded by people who are doing the actual news, like being on the sort of the opinion side of that wall and getting to take a couple of steps back every couple of days and say, well, here's sort of w the story that's emerging from all of this news um, is, is a good place to be. Because I, I do think that I'm trying to somewhat eptly um, or ineptly, depending on the case, make arguments in the course of every piece. And so it is, it's a, sometimes it'll be a weird, we're in a carpet store scenario, but there will always be a thesis. And so I, I, in a way, it's just the tools that I'm using might be like somewhat more r dependent on enormous spider metaphors, but the task that I'm doing is still a task of a traditional uh, opinion journalist, I think. Okay. Either way. Okay. Go ahead. I'll do oh. it. Yay. Speaking of tools, Alex, <laughs> uh -oh. what would life be like without MS Paint? Oh man, I miss MS Paint already. Although I've been sort of weeding myself off it in the hopes that like, you know how like, you stop speaking to your grandmother because she'll someday die? Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, obviously. That's a terrible way of doing it. <laughs> but that's what I did to MS Paint. Uh, and then it worked out because it is uh, vanishing from this world and I don't have to like deal with the fact that not only will I miss it every day, uh, but it's gonna vanish. But there's no longer like that, that piece of my day. But uh, I don't know. What other tools are there for the inept? I had I had like the paint, like the Mac tool, where you get to yeah. draw stuff. But th the trackpad, really, it's it's not as maneuverable as one might hope. Uh, Edward Wong from the New York Times. I've got two questions. One is among the cast of supporting characters around around Trump. Who do you think are the best for comic value? Have been the best for comic value? <laughs> and and then the second question is: Do you think there are circumstances or instances where? comedy might end up helping to normalize a type of government regime like this and so people just think oh it's great material it's entertaining and so there's a, they build up a certain level of tolerance for the antics of, of this type of governance I, I think those are both really really good questions and i think the second one like none of this is normal and i i think the function of, of comedy in a time like this is not to be like Oh, here are some fun characters. Like, let's play with them. Like, let's let's like fan fiction it up and be like, look at this guy. It's like because otherwise you're just being sort of flippantly treating these stories that have immense human consequences every day and that are like sapping away at norms, but also just like casually like making statements that you have to realize will have actual legislative or otherwise. Uh, consequences. So I don't, I don't know that anyone's like fun to make fun of, but I, I guess my hope in, in using humor in a time like this is to remind people of what normal used to look like and like make a joke that angles back towards that in some way. So instead of, because we know that we're living in a bizarre time and like to remind people of that and, and instead of being like, oh, look, here we are just our usual ritual where we turn on the press conference and there's a man screaming that the Statue of Liberty was actually, you know, not about welcoming immigrants. She was shooing them away with her, like, flaming torch. Like, th what? This is, a, this is not a normal thing. It's like every time you can point out this isn't normal, you know what would be normal if something different happened. But even the process of pointing out that this isn't normal is a routine that we do every day. And there is a certain point when you're like, well, we do have to live through this. So to the extent that sometimes the only power, like, using jokes is to enable people to maybe, I mean, you're gonna have to read the news anyway. And if you can read the news with jokes and feel a little bit better, then that I think has made the, th that's the utility of it. But I'm, I'm not sure, like, this is sort of a rambly question because it is, or answer, because it is a constant struggle of like, at what point are you like, oh, like, like Sean Spicer getting to come and, oh no, <laughs> I forgot where I was. <laughs> <laughs> At, at the Emmys, 
when Sean Spicer <laughs> got to just roll out and everyone's like, look how funny it is. We got this man who loves to lie. And it's like, that's not funny. Why is this something that you're just like, oh, he was a fun character. And being able to be like, instead of like, like conflating the Melissa McCarthy Sean Spicer and the actual Sean Spicer, I think is a mistake that people who like write humor about this can make. And he, Melissa McCarthy Sean Spicer, 100% put her there, roll her out, have her tell the joke. But Sean Spicer is someone who's actually doing things, things that have consequences and that are undermining institutions in really powerful ways and like that's not okay and shouldn't be normal but if you lose that distinction it's bad but anyway I'm sure he's nice person. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Heidi Lake with the editorial. I wonder just if you could go through the mechanics of how you're in the newsroom like do you uh, participate in an editorial meeting every morning and or do you have editors who assign you like today we want you to take on Carter Page or are you totally on your own? I'm not totally on my own like we'll have sort of a morning email where I'll, I'll say, hey, today I'm thinking of writing about this. How does that sound? And like, here's the three things I'm working on this week. And like, I've got on the back burner this. And they'll say, oh, we would really love, like, especially on every Saturday, I'm on the print newspaper. And they'll say, we'd really love something on the page for this. So if you were also thinking of writing about that, that's great. Please do that one first and do the other one like later. And that will be on the internet. So it's a, it's a mix of that. I, I used to back in my intern days go to editorial meetings, but now I'm uh, I don't always you do important. that. You can mine stuff if you're actually in an editorial meeting. If you're getting more information, then you, you know. Yeah. But you're not in on the editorial. I no, I haven't been recently, but. <clears throat> My name is Roger Stacy. I've been teaching uh, courses in satire for 40 years, and um, uh, some, a question that's occurred to me recently is that um, uh, traditionally satire was written by men and traditionally women were objects of satire. And in recent years, there's been an absolute explosion of women in the field. And I was wondering if uh, you have any view of what accounts for that. Well, I think women have always been around. Um, and <laughs> it's, and I also, I guess the, the distinction, uh, on the, on the one hand, I, I, I think men primarily got ac access to things like owning land and property and like having voices. And like women writers have been existing for decades because that's one of the things you can do even if you don't quite have a room of your own Virginia Woolf style, you can still be sitting there scribbling and getting it out there like Jane Austen did or Phyllis Wheatley did or people like that were still able to get their voices heard. But I think it's an interesting like, th just the fact that you said satire was like done on women, as, as, as like women were this special species of thing that you could make like this sort of othered object. Um, I think it's good that now we have the reminder that no, we're just people, we have voices. Uh, some men are funny and some women are funny and some men write good satire and some women write good satire. And uh, I think it's just a function of just the realization that women are people, while shocking, uh, has become more and more widespread <laughs> lately. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know, I think it's just the the, Th that. <laughs> who, who, who were some of your influences? I'm a big, just in terms of who got me through the election, Robert Benchley, I love his stuff because it can be very pointed, but it's also very <coughs> ebullient and has a joy in it that when you're sitting there sort of staring at Ted Cruz footage for eight hours of the day, you're like, give me some joy, world. Um, <laughs> although, like, I don't know, I, I enjoy Ted Cruz footage. Um, I, I've sort of Stockholm syndromed myself into enjoying all of this. Um, like, but there's like a certain point when you, all you eat every day is a onion sandwich, your body starts assuming that's a normal thing to eat and start, starts making its sinews out of that. I, I hope that's how it works. Um, but other influences, I mean, Dorothy Parker, speaking of women who are funny, uh, but she's like acid funny. Like her, that famous resume where she goes, you know, guns aren't lawful, loose, nooses give, gas smells awful, you might as well live. <laughs> it's like, that's dark, Dorothy. <laughs> but so, yeah. Um, I'm Anita Harris, I'm a writer. 
I was just wondering if you happen to see the Saturday Night Live skit on uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. This, this past week? I, I didn't see it. Oh. Can, can you describe it to me? Or, uh, well, yeah, I'll look it up. I mean, you're thinking, she, like, she, I, I thought that uh, the stuff they did on Jen Spicer was hilarious. Like, I mean, it's outrageous, and all of the people, um, I saw it on Facebook, and some people said, she deserves it, she's really terrible, and, all, and she's a liar, and all this stuff. I, I personally thought it was a little over the top, so to speak, <laughs> but um, anyway, I just was wondering um, what you or anybody else thought, because they're, they're picking on a woman now in, yeah, in, I, in, the, in the same spot. Well, I think that's interesting. I know certainly with like their parodies of Kellyanne, which I, I, I have seen, where like they were doing like the horror movie tropes. I think it's always interesting. I, I think 100% you should be able to attack women if women are doing things that are bad. That's what equality should mean. Um, <laughs> but I also think that it's telling how people attack women. So if they're like, oh, that like horse face, no worries, she's on the wrong side. So I can say horse face. It's like, no, that's still like, you attack her substantively. And so like when they were doing like it, Kellyanne, I'm like this, you know, but ver it's it's been interesting seeing like which attacks feel sort of like they're revealing more about the person making the attack than about the thing that they're trying to criticize. Hmm. Other questions? Yeah. I'd be kind of curious for your thoughts on satire and humor and partisanship because I think a criticism or a comment that's often made is that The Daily Show and work like yours appeals a lot to a liberal audience and is alienating to or just doesn't resonate with a conservative one. That's not to say that like all humor should appeal to everybody, because obviously that's not the point. But I kind of wonder about the potential for humor, humor and satire to kind of build consensus or bring people together, or if that's not even the role for it, or kind of what your thoughts are on those questions. Yeah, I, I do think about those questions because I, on the one hand, one of the purposes of satire should be to convince people. But like, if you look at the original, like the uh, OG satire about like, let's eat these babies, everyone, uh, with Jonathan Swift and Modest Proposal, he was sort of making that in a world where if you suggested, hey, what if we ate babies, people wouldn't be like, yes, you know, you make some valid points. And I think, so the sort of, <laughs> if we, like, the heightened, like, making things more absurd than they are in order to make an argument function of like, well, clearly if you see that you go all the way to this point, if you, if you follow your logic out, isn't, that doesn't really work as much anymore because people are, like, if we, people are literally like wandering around dressed as Nazis, like, you can't be like, you know, you look like a Nazi when you say that. It's like, yes, I'm dressed as a Nazi and making Nazi salutes. Like, I, clearly I'm not one of those people who's gonna be bothered by being likened to a member of the Third Reich. So figuring out, like, do, how do you use it to persuade, I think, that's something I'm working on. Like, there are jokes that everyone should be able to laugh at because sometimes you just need humor that's not based on, like, making an argument. But when you are making an argument, how do you make an argument <coughs> that reaches people? And I guess that's a, a question that I continually wonder about because sometimes if you're, if you're just... One of the ways you can do it is to give people who agree with you more arguments to use that maybe they'll be able to go and sit down with the proverbial uncle at Thanksgiving and say, well, you know, here's this extra thing that maybe I hadn't thought of that will work, but I, I don't know. I, I wonder about it a lot because I do think that is a trap that people fall into, do, and I'm not sure how to bridge it. Does Breitbart have a humorist? I think they think they do. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, my name, I'm a um, fellow at the center, and actually building on that question, do you find, do you know any conservative uh, uh, humorists that, that you follow? <laughs> I mean, Aristophanes, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> he was, he was all like, you know, boys these days, they have like the these thin butts, and they used to have big butts back in the day, and we should go back to that. Like genuinely, conservative humor from the 460s, or 410s BC. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, well, I did go to CPAC, which is a f fun thing that I do because I'm in, like, this Stockholm Syndrome place where that's a fun activity <laughs> for me. And it's great because, like, they recently have it in this big terrarium uh, called the Gaylord National Harbor. And it's, like, glass and a fake trees and a little fake village. And then you have all these meetings. But sometimes they'll have a comic performing there. And I'm always like, what's the comedy going to be? And it's usually just, like, you people are too easily offended by things based comedy. So it's, like, comedy from, like, 30 years ago that people have stopped doing because they're like, this is no longer a funny joke to us it's like like there's this whole riff this guy was doing about you know 
kids these days, they're like too weak and they don't, they wear helmets all the time. And I used to play on concrete. Like this was an actual joke from his set. And I'm like, if you are afraid to play on concrete, then put a helmet on. I'm like, yes, I will. That sounds correct. I don't want to do either of those things. But so I think, but going back to your point of like, it's, it's coming from a worldview, like sort of, it's like, how should the world be? Let's make a joke about how it's not that way. And so a lot of like conservative humor, like my grandmother's always been like, Greg Gutfeld is great. You should try to do more stuff like he does. And, um, but his like premises when he's making jokes are like, it's weird that we don't get to say Christmas anymore. And I'm like, it's weird that it's like November 7th and everything is Santa. Um, so, but those both are worldviews that we have of like what the world should look like. And so maybe I don't find it funny because the thing that it thinks is ridiculous, I think is a good normal thing. So. Hi, I'm Saul Penn, I'm, I'm a member of the community. Um, <laughs> women in particular can be treated cruelly and abusively by the internet. Have you experienced that and how do you cope? I have a little, I, th I still think parts of the internet that could be really mean don't know about me yet and I'm hoping that will continue. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't tell them. Um, <laughs> but I will get a lot of like, emails and it's always I deal with it by looking for misspellings usually um, and if there's a misspelling then I feel better uh, but sometimes like perversely instead of responding when someone has taken the time out of their day to write me a nice note being like I really enjoyed that piece thank you for what you do instead of responding to that someone will be like I hate you you're a cow I bet you haven't made a man erect in a year be honest <laughs> actual tweet that I recently got <laughs> I'm just like, just like the, 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 that's a strange metric. Um, <laughs> but, and I really wanted to respond to that. Um, <laughs> or somebody's like, you, did you go to Slattenly Middle School? And I, I'm like, that was, like just the, the specific specificity of these insults really makes me want to like, so I'll spend like half an hour thinking of a great response. And I'm like, no, I can't send it because it took me half an hour. And they'll be like, here's a timestamp on you responding. It, and it's like just two letters. Um, so I, I don't know, I guess my answer is, I find it amusing and because it hasn't involved actual threats to life and limb. So that's been good. Um, but yeah, I, I get it much better than a lot of people. Uh, have, you, have you noticed a change in tone uh, online, specifically on Twitter, in the last 24 months? Well, the funny thing was, I thought there was going to be more of one. But I think, like, after Gamergate, like, that was sort of a seminal moment in terms of, like, the internet has been like this, and it's been there, and it just hasn't been sort of willing to come into the open. So, like, almost the proverbial boiling frog situation rather than like suddenly after inauguration it got worse although like i did write a piece about inauguration and i got all these emails in my inbox the next morning being like you're no melania and i was like that's an accurate statement um <laughs> but and so i thought oh it's going to be so much worse now but after that it really sort of died down so i think it's always been there and now people are emboldened but they've been emboldened for a little longer than i think we gave them credit for being other questions Yep. It's a minor. <laughs> I'm Susan Hargrave. I'm an alum of the Education School. Um, one thing that I think about, I, I really enjoy satire about Trump, but I sometimes wonder with his fragile ego if it's going to backfire and make him into an even worse <laughs> person than he already is. Do you ever think about that? Well, part of me wonders, because I, I know like the Colbert Report does this sometimes where they like do the news that they think he wants to see and they're like, isn't it great? You're so beautiful. And a part of me does think that like that is what he wants is, is people just to be like, we love you. Like, it's okay. Like, you can come home now. Um, <laughs> and just like, but I, I guess if I knew that he was reading me, <laughs> I would worry about it more. And there was that one time when I'm like, Oh no, Gadzooks, maybe he has been. But for the most part, I'm writing with the assumption that Donald Trump is not like sitting there wrapped being like this. Waiting for your next tweet. This gal, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I think he sort of did expect that people would be nice to him and no, and people are just treating him in there. Both like saying this is bad. And I, I, he, he was hoping for a honeymoon that never came. And I don't know. Um, what, do you have a, a favorite book you've read recently? 
I recently, I just read fairly recently Roughing It by Mark Twain, um, which was fun. And then I started reading Innocence Abroad, and it, it does not hold up as well, which I feel bad like telling people that because like I don't want Mark Twain to be like, goodbye forever. But uh, <laughs> Innocence Abroad is just him like making awkward like racist jokes about groups that I'd forgotten we used to be like as a society. Like everyone's just like French people. It, like here are some very specific stereotypes we have. And that's what Innocence Abroad is. Um, but Roughing It is mostly him making fun of himself, which is great. Um, because he goes uh, west and mines silver and doesn't succeed at all. And there's just a lot of like him traveling west by stagecoach and having a good old time. So I'd recommend that. <laughs> do, do you have a, a favorite pun? Oh, favorite pun. Um, I do. There, there's like a three word pun that I'm impressed by. Um, well, let's hear it. That's like, what did. Um, what this man had, he was a cattle man, and uh, he had three healthy sons, and so he named his ranch Focus Ranch because it's the place where the sons raise meat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I like it, but <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a, like a famous one from like Cleopatra when she was trying to like reassure Mark Antony about the loss of the city of Turin, who's, or Turin, whose name also means ladle. And so she's like, why would we be sad if we lost a ladle? But I guess it played better in the original Egyptian. <laughs> um, so I really, really love the piece that you wrote about, like after everything came out about Harvey Weinstein, that piece was amazing and it just like, just made everything more clear. So, but when I was reading it, it seemed just like more of a cathartic kind of way of writing. I'm just curious, like, what's your writing process like? Does it kind of like depend on what you're writing about, or like, can you talk a little bit? Yeah, no, that that one was a, a different process than, than usual because sometimes you're just like, I'm going to make a joke that will have a structure, and it will be like, I'm going to summarize it, and so it'll be dialogue or I'm going to describe something happening and so it'll be a series of paragraphs and that one I was just like I have a lot of I can't believe people aren't getting this and so I had a giant sort of notes file on my phone where I was just like here's everything that I feel about this and then I had to sort of decant it and capitalize it properly and like figure out but just just going from like like inarticulate rage into hopefully articulate rage um, and so that one was really like a case of I'm not even sure if this is funny, but I just need to say it, sort of. And were you surprised by the response it got? I was. I mean, <laughs> again, I was surprised, but not shocked. Um, <laughs> in terms of, I think, what surprises me is not that like women know that this is happening, but like that so many guys just don't realize that this is a thing, and that we have to keep explaining and explaining. Like moving through the world in women mode is a an experience that has all these surprising pitfalls that like you know if you were just choosing in a video game you would be like no it's way easier to not have to continually have to relate to people in this way um and just all the stuff that you have to brush off in the course of like i would rather like live my day as a human being in the world and so i'm going to just not deal with that it's it's tiresome and but it's unfortunately ubiquitous. And I was sort of hoping, and, and the sad thing about all the Weinstein allegations and all the responses is like, you realize how ubiquitous it is and that even people that you're like, I, I wish you, I hoped you had been spared this, but no one's been spared it. So, um, but. Yeah. Hi, Hi I'm Emily Dreyfus. I'm a Neiman Fellow. Um, I'm a huge fan. And while you're talking about women, I guess I, I wonder if when you were growing up and dreaming about being a writer, uh, did you, did you experience any people in your life who were not supportive of being a satirist? Or, <laughs> um, uh, or not skeptical of that utility? <laughs> I, I think fortunately my folks have always been like, clearly what you want to do is write, and we don't know what format you're going to do it in. But like they were actually like encouraging me into like journalism because they're like, you love to talk to people and yeah. you love to like write things, and that's a pr profession that combines both of those things. Um, and. Although my dad was like, you should be a classics professor because they just like allow you to, they have all these endowed chairs from like the 19th century and then you can just take tours of the Mediterranean for the rest of your life. And he wasn't wrong, good, honestly. <laughs> I'm like, I could like be doing that, but also be writing. But like, I guess the, the short answer is 
surprisingly no, and I think I often feel that I am better on paper, and if other people agree with that, then they're like, please do more things on paper. Um, mm -hmm. So. Final question. All right, what are you uh, what are you proudest of in your work? I think. I don't know. Right after the election, everyone was sort of going through this phase where they were like, uh, why are we doing what we do? Like, you know, tears fell like rain and everyone like rethought their lives. And um, my sort of philosophical justification for what I was doing was like, even if all I'm doing is basically serving someone quiche and it makes their like day slightly better because they've gotten to eat quiche that day instead of having to deal with all the stuff that they were still going to have to deal with, but no quiche, um, I got to do that. But I think the thing that I'm like proudest of is this piece I wrote a while back about like woman in a meeting speak has become like people use it as a way of like framing a discussion and I'm like oh cool I like gave somebody like a lexical lex uh, lexical shortcut uh, between these like mm -hmm. ideas that's neat that's what writing is like my goal in doing is you make people have ideas that are neighbors now and they didn't use to talk um, and do you think um Speaking of the election, you kind of open this up a little there. Do you think that the, your your peers in journalism that is there a sense of reflection about what's happened in the last twenty four months? I mean, it's hard to reflect while you're also di like digging in as hard as possible to keep doing what you do. But I think there's been sort of like a it's like a deep inhale, being like, if journalism matters, now's the time to do it. Okay, go and like reflecting on the fly as people like jog along with like their multiple phones, um, but. I don't know, people I think feel a sense of purpose about it. And especially when like, it keeps coming under attack. They're like, although the funny thing is like, the media loves to talk about like, oh no, the media is under attack. And it's like, does everyone care about this as much as we do? But like, we should all care about it because it's necessary to a well-functioning democracy to have a functioning press that can like give you good information. Because at a certain point, if you're getting bad information, your decisions are all gonna be wrong. Um, <laughs> and we should value having a source of <coughs> correctness. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure like everyone's 100% like the most important thing that happened today was any attack that was made on the media, which it, it often is an important thing, but it's not the only important thing. There's also other stuff. All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us today. Big hand for Alexandra Petri.